All right, our next presenter is Chris Clymer. He is an Academy Award winning computer graphics professional who is perhaps best known as the inspiration for the title of the Poe Bronson's The Nudist on the Late Shift, but is also a longtime expert of near pioneer status. All of those things are true. All right, so I want to talk to everybody today about the Mac. Uh, a lot of you guys probably have a Mac. A lot of you guys probably think your Mac is bulletproof, and I'm here to make your ha Mac unhappy. And if with any luck, my iPhone won't screw up this presentation. And I think it already is. Backup plan. Some Macs may be harmed in the course of this presentation. If you've got a younger Mac, you might want to remove him from the room. He might get upset. He might be a little sad. If you've got an iPhone, mine's already on its way out of here. Why hack the Mac? Common wisdom is your Mac magically more secure. Nobody can break in. It's better than your Windows machine. Nobody's doing anything evil to it. Magically, it's better. Thing is, nobody's really working that hard at it. There's not a lot of stuff out there to secure your Mac. There's not a lot of people out there writing about how to secure your Mac. Maybe we're just not thinking that hard about it. Maybe we're just all, we've got all our heads in the sand and we don't know what trouble might be coming. So the reason we think that the Mac is more secure than other operating systems. It's built on Unix, right? Unix is perfect. Nothing, ever bad, nothing bad ever happens on Unix. There's never any vulnerabilities. So of course, the Mac doesn't have any vulnerabilities either, right? Nobody's got a Mac. There's not enough of them out there. Why would anybody bother wasting their time on one? I mean, there's much better things to be hitting with your attacks. And, and you don't run as administrator by default on the Mac. It, hey, if you're not running as administrator, nothing bad can happen either, right? Thing is, Unix systems, they do have vulnerabilities. Sun will tell you that, Red Hat will tell you that, IBM, any Unix vendor, they've got a long list of them, and Sun and Red Hat in particular every single month. You'll see a, a nice list of, of all kinds of new problems that, that they're fixing, which is good, but any piece of software is going to have flaws, and Apple is not magically immune from that. Um, they can reduce their hardware down to one button, but that doesn't make it simple enough that you can't find ways to attack their operating system. Um, and security through obscurity isn't really security at all. Um, and 7% of the market is still a lot of people out there with Macs. And that's just, that's just Macs. That's not including iPods. That's not including iPhones. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff out there. And, and they're building more, more things running their software every single day. And obviously, you, you don't need admin privs to make evil things happen. There's a lot of good stuff you can do um, without needing them at all. And, of course, you can escalate privileges on a Mac. Then you do have your admin rights, and game over. Oh, you know, maybe, maybe we're not trying hard enough. Uh, but we are. Uh, a couple years ago, some guys had what they called the, the month of Apple bugs. Let's take a month, and let's just work as hard as we can to find problems in, in Mac operating systems. And they did. Every day, they had a new one. Now, they, they worked on them ahead of time. They had to use all stored up events. Not like they just every day started from scratch. But point is, for a month, they released something new every day. So guess what? There have been problems in the Mac OS. Now, these things got patched, and were, Apple was very busy that month. But p point is that if you guys just decided for a couple of months there to really, let's target this, and they found stuff. If more people are targeting it, you're probably going to find more. This was just a couple of guys looking at it for a short period of time. I'll talk a little bit about how, how OS X is put together. Uh, it's, it's, a lot of, uh, it's a lot of proprietary Apple stuff, open source BSD licensed code, a little bit of GPL stuff. All this stuff kind of stuck together to build their own OS. So there's some things that, that work like you would expect on a, on a Linux or BSD system. There's some things that, that make no sense at all. Um, go and edit the, the resolve.com file on your Mac, and you'll pull your hair out. Why am I not changing my DNS records? They've got their own daemon for that, but they still leave the file around. They do a lot of weird things their own little Apple way. Um, they, they, they change the behavior of a lot of these tools. Um, they also like to standardize on specific versions of tools. Uh, not a common thing for, for a lot of uh, commercial software vendors. You want to have your stable version. Everybody knows this works. It's been tested. It's what people expect. But 
a lot of times they will standardize on that version that they're comfortable with, and maybe, it, maybe there's vulnerabilities in that in the open source version. Um, an example of that, uh, there was a, a, a Perl, a Perl runtime, what was it, PCRE. They included a WebKit. And one of the, um, one of the vulnerabilities that Charlie Miller found in, um, in Safari was in WebKit, was in PCRE, and, and, and the way he put it was, all you really need to do to find an Apple vulnerability, go down the list of open source software that, that's built into an Apple product. Once you've identified one of those pieces of open source software, go read the change log. Look at all the security changes that have been made, go take advantage of them in OS X, because they probably haven't gotten around to updating the latest version that fixes all those things. It's not hard. You know, So kind of a, a little bit of a picture of, of how the different pieces are put together. There's a, there's a lot going on here. Um, you've got all of Apple's proprietary stuff with, with Aka, with Carbon, with Coco. Um, but you've got all this open source code right there at the core in, involved in the networking, involved in tying these things together with the mock kernel. Um, Darwin stuff is all open source utilities. Uh, one thing to take away from that, there's a lot of attack service there. There's a lot of different pieces being put together there. And a lot of them, again, are open source ones that you can easily go out and, and just read through the change lock. So some of the things that Apple has done to secure their OS, and they've, they've, they've done some, some good things. Uh, stack protection. Uh, stack protection is something new in Leopard. A lot of these things are new in Leopard. So if you're running Tiger, you're, you're a lot worse off. Um, Leopard, they've improved a lot of things. Um, they added the, the stack protection. Um, it puts what, they, what you call a canary in the stack. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of like a checksum. You put that value in there, and it, it gets checked before this code is actually going to be run. If it doesn't match up, you sound the alarm, everything you know, goes kablooey, and it won't actually go and run your evil code. Um, it's a smart thing to do. It's a really great feature. Not everything uses it. Safari doesn't use it. And if I'm a bad guy and I'm going to attack your system, the first thing I'm going to go and attack is your browser. So not using that in Safari, kind of a problem. Library randomization, another good technique. You're trying to randomize where things are at in memory, so it's hard for you to predict, hard to do all of your techniques to you know, overwrite the memory and, and make evil things happen. Very good thing to do. It, it doesn't randomize everything. And in fact, what it does is it randomizes things at a, at a set point in time. So you can consistently predict where everything is going to be out of memory for the same box for a long period of time. When you, um, when you actually do the install, when you do certain types of software updates, it will change the system enough that those locations can change, but they'll, they'll also be similar enough, or many of them be similar enough, on two different machines that you can predict based on one particular library on, on your two separate machines where the rest of them are going to get mapped to on either of them. They're random, but they're not all random. If you can predict one, you can figure out where the rest are. So, so maybe pseudo-random, pseudo-library randomization. Uh, everything's not fully randomized. Process injection. On, on, on the Windows operating systems, uh, we have DEP. We have data execution protection. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing to have. It, it prevents any of the code executing from the stack. The problem is all it does is protect code from executing from the stack. It doesn't protect anything else. You can execute code from the heap. You can leverage that to execute code on the stack. So it's, it's similar to some of these other things where they're, they're doing something good from an architecture perspective, but it hasn't filtered its way out to all of the different, to, to everything. So you're not really fully protected. And, and maybe the developers at Apple are, are a little bit lazy too. They're, Lazy is the right word. A, a little bit diluted. <laughs> uh, we're, not, we're not seeing a lot of attacks on this yet, so they can take their time, they can come up with these good ideas, and work out how they're going to be implemented everywhere without causing the user a lot of trouble. Because at the end of the day, you don't buy an Apple because it's more secure. You tell yourself that later on to justify why you spent two or three grand on the Apple. You buy the Apple because it's shiny and it's pretty and it runs a lot of cool software and you want one. And that's what Apple wants to protect. They want you to have this good user experience. Well, the more you tighten up security, the harder it is to, to protect the usability. So 
you know, it's, it's hard for them to do both well, and they're, they're really erring on the side of usability. Uh, it's, it's, it's somewhere that, that Microsoft certainly was in the past, and you've seen with, with Vista, Microsoft swings the other direction. Let's really, let's try to address some of the architectural problems. Let's tighten it down, and everybody complains. Oh my God, I can't do my work. This thing pops up all the time. Do you want to run this? Do you want to run that? So Apple doesn't want to get into that area, especially with all the noise over Vista. It'd be a bad time for them to do it. Firewall. Firewalls are a good thing. Everybody should have a firewall. Everybody should have their firewall on. Um, Leopard has an application where a firewall, it turns it off by default. Um, when it is on, it only filters the inbound traffic. Because, right, nothing evil will ever come out of your box. You only have to protect from the bad guys coming in. Um, if you enable certain services in the US, you turn on things like file sharing, you turn on things like sharing, sharing your session remotely, it'll automatically poke a hole through the firewall for you so people can get in. Um, it, it's kind of a Swiss cheese sort of firewall. It's, it's good to have it there, but there's so many ways to get through it that even when it is on, it's almost better not to have it at all. Sandboxing, another feature that they've added in Leopard. So you can sandbox individual applications. Um, if somebody does manage to exploit that application, they're not going to get to your OS. They're not going to get root on the box. They're limited to just owning that app. There's still lots of bad things that can happen there. If, let's say, the app was Safari, where a lot of your information probably is, or your mail application, where you've probably got some, some interesting data. But, but sandboxing is good. But they don't sandbox everything. Uh, to sandbox an app, you have to define very clearly all the things it's going to need. Uh, it's a lot of work. For something like Safari, there's a lot of stuff to define. There's a lot of different files it access, a lot of things that it needs to do. And again, usability is going to be figured in over security. We don't want the users to have problems, so we're going to make sure stuff works. We'll worry about security later. So Safari is not sandboxed. A lot of things aren't sandboxed, and Apple doesn't really, it's not a, an openly documented here, everybody uses this kind of thing. It's a kind of secret sauce. We use it on so I think I'd rather have coffee than the mic. You could create your own policies. It's not documented. It's not supported by Apple, but you can do it. Um, it's, it's easy to look through, and I, I had it in my notes that are lost on the iPhone, uh, the actual file where you can dig through your Mac and see how the policies are created. And um, based on those, create your own for your own app. Not documented, not supported, but you can do it, which is cool. Um, but they should probably be encouraging more developers to use it. I expect that'll happen in the future. It's something new in Leopard. So they're, they're kind of you know, putting their feet in the water. So some of the problems with the default configuration out of the box. You know, a thing you always hear is that you know, out of the box, Microsoft products are, are insecure. And, and the default configuration is very weak. And you just don't ever plug into the internet without fixing everything. But, but a Mac, Mac and Linux and these other things, they're better. Out of the box, they're much more secure. They're much more hardened. So, you know, you don't even have to think about it. You know, I mean, it's only got one mouse button. You don't. You shouldn't have to worry about security. You pound your head on the keyboard, and the internet appears, and everybody's happy. Maybe not. Again, primary concern for Apple: they want things to be usable. They want things to be pretty and shiny, and they want them to just work. If you're going to spend time diagnosing problems, you would have bought a PC. More usability, weaker security. Uh, if Ideally, you can make both work well together, but they tend to be at odds with each other. It's very difficult to do both well. And again, customers don't buy things based on security. They buy them based on Shiny. Apple's default configurations are not really any better than those in Microsoft products. And in many cases, they are actually worse, like not having a firewall on. Firewall is disabled. Uh, passwordless login is enabled. You know, when you, you don't want to be hassled with typing in credentials when you boot up your Mac. Just log me right in, right? It'd be a lot easier. Uh, Apple has great things like encrypted memory. You can encrypt your home directory. Um, these are really cool things, but those aren't enabled by default. Um, I can understand a little better on that one. That's still difficult to get a user around, but it's still a weakness. Great feature that, that isn't there. 
There's a lot of things you can do if you poke around to tighten your Mac up, but they're just not on by default. Um, the, the Vaulter credentials are another good one. Um, it, you can have different, different credentials you use, whether they're things you're doing in Safari, um, things you're doing locally on a box. Credentials will get cached or optionally cached on your Mac. It puts them into its own vault. The password for that vault is the same as your login password by default. That means that if you want to open up that vault, you don't have to put in any creds. It's very, very easy and convenient, very usable. But it also means the password is the same as what you use to log in with. And if somebody manages to get into your login session, again, not even you don't have to sudo to root. You don't have to provide credentials here. If somebody manages to somehow get into your session, they can get to your vaulted passwords. So that, that is an issue. You can change them, but now you've got to remember two passwords, kind of that whole chicken and egg single sign-on thing. Um, guest access to file shares is turned on by default. Nothing's shared by default. You know, you're not sharing out your, your root hard drive or anything, but by default, a guest user can get in any file shares you do create. Um, you can lock, you can set up the screensaver to lock. That's turned off by default as well. Safari. Safari is a very popular target on the Mac. Uh, Safari is, uh, if you're not familiar with Safari, it's the web browser on the Mac. Um, it is probably the most exposed application in OS X. Um, to be fair, the browser is the, the most exposed things on, on really any OS. If I'm going to attack a Windows machine, um, a client, you know, a desktop Windows machine, I'm going to look at IE. If I'm going to attack a Mac, I'm going to look at Safari. Uh, if I'm attacking a Linux machine, I'm probably going to look at Firefox. Unless I've got some, you know, O'Day Lynx vulnerability I'm going to use. But, uh, so Safari is what you're probably going to attack. Um, for the last two consecutive years, it's been exploited at CanSec West. In fact, the vulnerability used year two, he had year one, he sat on it for a year, and then used it to win the second year. Same guy won both years. So nobody else found this in a year, which says people aren't looking that hard. Um, it also says those people include Apple. You know, that O'Day was sitting around for a year and it still worked. Um, the, the, the way he's put it is it, it's... It's easy. All you got to do is read the change logs. Uh, Safari renders or parses more than 20 different formats, um, PDFs, and, and uh, we've got all kinds of different image types here. Um, we've got Java plugins. We've got QuickTime plugins. We've got Flash plugins. What this means is Safari is very, very complex. You've got all these different things going on, and the more complex you're making it, the more the more potential there is for a bug, the more potential there is for a bug, the more potential there is for an exploit. The attack service on Safari is huge. URL handlers can be used by Safari to launch an external application. So if I can make your user go to one of these types of URLs that I've constructed, I can make that open up a different application. You know, maybe I don't want to attack Safari. You know, maybe I figure they, they've, they've spent enough time on Safari, but these, some of these desktop apps, you know, may, maybe, um, maybe iCal, the calendaring app on your desktop, maybe I don't think you, they've spent much time working on that. So I'd rather have my exploit launch in that program instead of trying to exploit Safari. Um, some of the things you can potentially launch through Safari are uh, VNC sessions. You can do file share mounts. Uh, Safari automatically opens certain file types and other applications. Uh, this allows somebody to target applications that are considered local. There are certain safe file types. These are things that open up without any prompting because nobody's ever going to do anything evil to you um, through these safe file types. They are all defined within that file there. And um, I mean, nothing bad ever happens through PDF, right? Nothing evil's ever come through on one of those, so we should just open it right up and not think twice about it. Um, QuickTime, same thing. I mean, you almost never see security updates for QuickTime. Um, it'll open up installer packages automatically. To be fair on that one, um, when it goes to install, you're probably going to be popped for your creds uh, and maybe have a Trojan installed in the background. But, but at least you're going to be prompted for your credentials. There's a lot of stuff there. By default, it's going to open. It's very usable. It's very convenient. I, people don't have to think about it. They don't have to worry about which app is going to open it but not exactly the best decision for security. So I'll talk a little bit about malware for the Mac. I mean, there isn't any, right? Nobody's writing Mac malware. 
every year we, we get a report, the first Mac malware. It's, it's amazing. Every year or two, somebody writes the first piece. I, there's been a lot of them. Um, if you look here, it's a little small, but you can see um, April 2004, first malware for OS X, 2006, first OS X malware, 2008, OS X malware. Um, they've had a lot of firsts. I guess you just have a, a short memory. Like anyone else, uh, Apple's actually had a, a pretty long and distinguished history with malware. It had the first virus targeting home users, 1982. So there's been malware on Apple platforms probably longer than some of the people in this room have been alive. Uh, it spread via floppies. It popped that message up onto your screen. Not exactly dangerous, kind of cute, kind of miss those days when all you're going to do is that instead of trying to steal my credit card information or build a botnet. But 1982, Apple malware. 1987, we get our first virus for Mac OS. Uh, not different code base than the OS X we're used to. This OS 4.1. Um, they released the source code. So this actually stick, stuck around in different variants until OS 8. People kept improving on it, you know, kind of like this open source thing, making it better and better and, and great stuff. Um, one of the things NVIR did, it, it would stay dormant for a long time. You wouldn't see it right away. It'd get propagated all your backups. And then after a while, you would realize you had been infected. One of the funny things it would do, it would use the, the, the ability for the Mac to do text-to-speech, and it would talk to you out loud and say, don't panic. Nothing to worry about. Again, it's cute, a lot better than stealing my credit card information, sending spam. Uh, things aren't that way anymore. On February uh, 13, 2006, we get our first OSX worm, leap.a. Uh, it spread by sending it around through instant messaging, through the iChat application that is bundled with the Mac. So it's not, not third party, bundled with the Mac. Um, it's a Trojan. It's not a very good Trojan. Um, once it sticks itself in an executable, that executable no longer runs. It's usually a pretty good sign that something bad has happened. Um, but it would go through all of your buddies on your iChat list, and it would you know, do a file send to all of them. And if they could accept it, and they were running a Mac, all right, now they've got this crappy Trojan. So, so far, no nothing bad's happening. You know, Clearly, it's vulnerable, but at least we're not seeing the kind of uh, financial problems you see on, on the other platforms. Incutana, we get Incutana in 2006. You notice that's three days after this other worm, so we get our first worm. Three days later, you get the next worm, which kind of suggests it wasn't that hard to write the worm, just nobody thought about it. After this first one came out, security researchers, you know what? I think I could do that too. This was a proof of concept written by a researcher, spread over Bluetooth using OBEX file requ uh, push requests. And um, it would add itself to, to launch agents, which means um, basically when you boot up your computer, it's going to launch this program on your, on your next reboot. You know, it's, it was reasonably well written, but proof of concept. Again, no payload. This guy's just doing it all for, for good. So what do we have out there right now? You know, what kind of threats are there? Well, if, if anybody's watched... Any, any kind of news on the Mac or, or read Slashdot in the last 24 hours um, or downloaded iWork09, um, we've got OSX.i service. Um, it is a Trojan in iWork09 in Adobe Photoshop CS4. So if you're going out in tor torrent sites, you're downloading pirated software, you may be getting this. The really stupid thing about it is you can download iWork09 off of Apple.com for free. It's a fully functional version. Expires after 30 days. The only thing they need is a serial number. Despite this, people are pirating the Trojan version off of torrents. It's the first Apple botnet. Supposedly, there are 20,000 people infected with this. Um, supposedly, there was a denial of service attack in January of this year. So this is, as far as I'm aware, the, the first report of the, the same evil things we're used to on other platforms being done from the Mac platform. You know, this is, this is a real attack. 20,000, I mean, it's, it's not Storm, it's not Configure, but it's, it's a good start. And, um, you know, there's a lot of us Mac users out there, and, I mean, come on, we're, we're magically secure and we don't run antivirus, so we're probably susceptible to some of these things. 
um, bundled as a package within the iWorker Photoshop installer. The package is called iWorkServices.pkg. If when you were installing your sketchy version of iWork and you saw that package being installed, you've probably got a Trojan. Uh, it's a universal binary. It's cross-platform. It, it'll work on PowerPC and x86. Um, um, I, assuming it won't work on the, the ARM port to the iPhone because you don't have iWork on the iPhone. But who knows, maybe the Trojan works and just iWork doesn't. Uh, it'll be a fun one to try out. Um, it checks to see if it has root before attempting install. You know, when you get popped for your creds during the install, and that'll give it root as well. And if you haven't given it creds, it won't try to install the Trojan, so you don't get any nasty you know, error messages or anything weird. Uh, it opens up a back door, it dials into a command and control for the botnet, it encrypts the traffic to its command and control using AES encryption. You know, it's, it's a reasonably robust piece of malware. So, this looks familiar to anybody that's looked at malware on, on the other operating systems. I, I put this up here just to give an idea that this is the same stuff. There's nothing special about Mac OS. The same crap that we get on Windows, we can get on the Mac. We get it on Linux too, but that's a different talk. Talk about the iPhone a little bit. A lot of people have the iPhone. Maybe more people have the iPhone than the Mac at this point. It's very popular. Uh, to give you an idea of, of what's going on under, under a hood on your iPhone, your iPhone is a little tiny Mac. You know, unlike you know, Windows, Windows CE, for example, on Windows mobile phones, different code base, very different things going on to write code for Windows Mobile versus Windows XP, Windows Vista. Writing code for the iPhone is very similar to writing code for the Mac. They've basically stripped away the fat, you know, put just what you need to make the phone work on there, and, and put a slick GUI on it, multi-touch, and accelerometer, so you can make photos jiggle around. And uh, it's, it's basically OS X ported over to the ARM platform. Um, the iPod OS is also certain parts of OS X running on that platform. Applications are packaged up in the same way. So again, very familiar environment. A lot of the same applications exist on both. And a lot of the security controls have been weakened or removed. So a lot of the good things that we see in OS X, they just aren't there. There were already flaws with those, and, and I guess Apple just said, well, why even bother on the iPhone? And nobody's going to try to attack that. I mean, come on. We all know your root password. The root password for your iPhone is probably either Dottie or Alpine, or they may, if they've changed it in later versions of the firmware, maybe in 3.0, it's some other very short, you know, alpha string. That's baked into your firmware. It's identical for all the different iPhones. Now, you don't have a shell enabled by default, so it shouldn't be too big of a problem unless you've jailbroken, you jailbreak, and you've got your SH server, and, but that's not supported by Apple, so that's not really their problem. But it is an issue that it's baked in. Not that big of an issue though, because guess what? Everything runs as root anyways. So I don't need your root password. If I can cause anything to be exploited on your iPhone, it's going to run as root. There is no privilege separation. You know, that's our, our magic stuff on Unix that's supposed to be better than Windows. We don't run everything as administrator. We do on the iPhone. Luckily, nobody's found a way to get a remote shell on, on, on an iPhone that has not been jailbroken, but they're working on it. They're very close. It's believed that you can make it happen. It just hasn't happened yet. Uh, it's very likely it's just a matter of time. And the, the great thing about that is I get a remote shell on your iPhone. I have a remote shell as root. Some of the issues in the applications that have been found, um, mail.app, it automatically renders all HTML mail. Now, now, other clients do this too. The thing about this, I can't turn it off. I can't say just give me plain text. So everything's going to be rendered. If you have anything evil going on, it's going to be harder for me to see it. It's going to pull down all the images automatically. Um, it's also going to truncate the long URLs. If you have a really long URL, you know, it, it's, it's hard for a user to see that. They don't want the user to have a bad experience, be traumatized by, by a gigantic URL. So they, they strip out a bunch of characters in the middle, try to shorten it to a little over 20 characters. And so you see the beginning and the end of the URL. You know, so if I make a URL of yourbank.com.mywebsite.org slash index.html, you know, if I make that long enough, you're, you're just going to see it as yourbank.com. So tremendous potential for phishing attacks on the iPhone. 
Uh, you can leverage these issues, again, for, for phishing, you can direct Safari to a malicious website that's got your own evil code to own Safari with. Uh, mobile Safari does not support all the file types that Safari on the desktop does. So you have a smaller attack surface. Um, it does use the same outdated open source software. Again, um, one of the vulnerabilities that was found in WebKit, this was an iPhone vulnerability when, when they were targeting Safari, they're targeting mobile Safari. And um, again, we read the change log on the open source project, you're going to find a bug. Works just as well for the iPhone, maybe even better because you don't have some other controls. Um, all, in, all the vulnerabilities that have been publicly identified for the iPhone have currently been patched. That doesn't mean they're not out there. It just means any security researchers that have reported them, Apple has fixed them. Everything that's been said suggests it's very easy to find these things. It doesn't take much time at all. There's probably others we don't know about yet. Um, the stuff that has been found, there have been heap overflows. Um, they allow you to own the phone through a simple JavaScript. So what can you do to make your Mac more secure? Don't let this guy be the one who owns your Mac. If you do, you'll be very embarrassed. Don't install sketchy software. Don't go out on the BitTorrent sites and pull down that free version of iWork or whatever. I mean, in, in looking at a lot of these, they're common sense for a PC user. I'm not saying anything radical here other than the Mac isn't magical. Steve Jobs didn't come down from the heavens and bless it to be immune to antivirus, to be immune to any kind of virus. It's got the same problems as anything else. You should be running these, you know, you should be patching your, your Unix machines, you should be patching your Mac, just like you should be you patch your Windows machines. Update your software. Apple has patched a lot of these vulnerabilities. If you patch them, you're not going to be vulnerable to them. On the iPhone in particular, it's very easy not to bother patching. That's why it's a lot more concerning with some of these issues. A lot of people don't bother. Doing a firmware update can be a hassle. I don't want to have to flash everything and start over, so these vulnerabilities are probably going to stick around. If I'm, a, if I'm a bad guy, for my money, I'm going after the iPhone. It's, it's a much juicier target. Um, yes, there are antivirus products for OS X. There's only a handful of viruses out there, but they are out there. There's going to probably be more of them if you have an antivirus product. They are going to be writing signatures and putting it on there. Yes, antivirus isn't perfect. Yes, there's a lot of ways to get around it, but it's going to stop some stuff, and especially on the Mac, things aren't that sophisticated yet. Um, there are HIDS products for the Mac as well. It's a good idea to run those. Um, there's a, a, a really good tool called Little Snitch for the Mac, which shows you any connections that are going outbound, inbound on your Mac, so you can see what's going on, what applications are trying to dial out. You have Little Snitch running, and you get the iWork Trojan. You're going to see, oh, look, I've got a reverse shell on my box. Maybe something bad has happened. Um, don't use Safari. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I don't use Safari. Um, it's, it's, it's a fine browser, but it's got a lot of problems, and uh, Firefox tends to have these things fixed quicker. Uh, Firefox uh, does not have this, quite the same attack service, and it's also got a, a robust set of third-party plugins, things like NoScript that I can do to limit my exposure while I am, I'm surfing. Uh, so I personally, I run Safari. You, you could use wget. That'd be fine, too. Uh, <laughs> Opera, just, just not Safari. Uh, to be fair too, a lot of Safari vulnerabilities are OS X specific. They don't work on the Windows version of Safari. Uh, but on your Mac, right now, that, that would be my recommendation. Don't run Safari. They're, they're going to, depending on the vulnerability, they may or may not apply to one or both. There's been lots of Firefox vulnerabilities that are Several are cross-platform. There have been lots in general. The thing is, they tend to get fixed, and there's a lot more people pounding away at it. So it's not that I'm, I think Firefox is special or, or better coded so much as it's getting stuff fixed a lot quicker. And it's not quite as exposed. It's not as integrated with the OS. So in, in a lot of ways, the issues with Safari on OS X are like the issues with IE on Windows. They're the same vendor. They want to bundle them together. They want the user to have a great experience. And that makes for more vulnerabilities. The, um, some, of the, some of the sources used for this, the Mac Hacker's Handbook, if you haven't seen it, 
Really great resource. If you want to take advantage of these vulnerabilities, if you want to write your, find vulnerabilities, write your own exploits for them, there are chapters in that book to show you exactly how to do that. And chances are, you're going to find stuff. Could be a fun new hobby. Uh, Mac OS X Internal is also another really, really good book about how everything works on the Mac, the architecture, a lot of things that aren't really documented very well uh, by Apple themselves. Um, it's about this thick, it's quite a read, it's probably more of a reference, but a lot of really great information in there. So if you, if you are interested at all in learning more about how your Mac ticks and how to break it, those two books would be my recommendation for where to start. And uh, lots of other good websites that are on here. And that is it. <laughs> Question in the back? Yeah, uh, what do you suggest as far as Mac antivirus? I, I, there's not any particular vendor that I, I endorse right now. They all only have a couple of signatures, but I would just recommend picking something. Anybody else? All right, thanks a lot. In the back? The bright lights in my eyes here. Uh, do you have a theory as to why the iPhone wasn't owned at uh, Pwn to Own? I mean, no one even touched the, if it's so easy. I, I think Charlie actually talked about it. I'm trying to remember why he said they didn't target it. Ah. So, <laughs> I guess he don't, didn't have another one in his back pocket from the last year. Um, and, and maybe he'd rather win you know, a free Apple than a, than a free iPhone. Um, basically, now I'm a PC user and, you know, not very literate on any of this stuff, but I remember the uh, comment in regard to Norton, um, well, Norton antivirus is a virus. Is it likely that Apple virus antiviruses are likely to have the same problem? An Apple antivirus will be a virus? <laughs> If you're, if you're doing these, these real-time scanning and things like that, it's obviously going to be a drain on your system. Yeah, in, in general, anything you're going to do like that is, is going to cause some problems. Some antivirus products are better in that regard than others. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a software development issue. I don't know that inherently antivirus has to bog down your system, but um, I would expect that as we get more threats on the Mac, as we need to, as we're running antivirus products on there, as we're running HIDS products on there, guess what? We're going to have our system bogged down more. We're going to need more memory. We're going to need more processor. Um, but hey, I mean, the Macs are all dual core and, and quad core now anyways. We've got plenty to spare, right? We're, we're heading in the same direction as, as a PC, really. So I, I guess the short answer to that is yes. You're probably going to have the same problems. We can just ask nicely for nobody to write any viruses. Or <laughs> anybody else? So I thought it was interesting that the first sort of real Mac exploit was relatively recent. And I just wondered, is it easier now if it's running on an Intel? I mean, before you would have had to go learn a more obscure architecture. The, a lot of these things will work on PowerPC or Intel. And, and remember, that, that particular uh, Trojan, cross-platform. Yeah. Um, Apple's done a lot of work to make things on the platform move easily between them. And, and again, Safari on the iPhone that is on the ARM platform. So you've got some things that might actually work in all three. Um, also, when, you, when you're targeting things, when, when some of these phishing attacks, or, or if you're targeting the browser, some of the browser-based attacks, they don't even care any platform you're on. Um, you know, it has nothing to do with the underlying hardware architecture. So in some ways, it's easier. You know, when, when you're, you're writing you know, some, some of your actual exploit code and hitting the OS, that's potentially going to be easier, at least more familiar. But I, I think it's more that it's just becoming more and more exposed, and, and now that it's on Intel, it's maybe easier for people to, to have their own VM and be hacking on it on their own, more obtainable maybe. Uh, that, that's just my own kind of theories. I, I don't know that it's necessarily a whole lot easier now that it's on Intel. I think it's mostly browsers anyway where it doesn't matter. What's that? I said I guess a lot of it's done in browsers anyway where it really doesn't matter right. that much. Right. At the end of the day, for, for any OS, the, the browser is really what we're most worried about anyways. 
Anybody else? But yes, you shouldn't install that pirated copy of Photoshop you have, Ted. Thanks. Um, no. Um, what about Safari 4, uh, the beta that's just been released a couple, bit, like a couple weeks ago or whatever? Um, I, I've not looked at that whatsoever. Okay. Okay. Just wondered. So if it's got any really cool whiz bang security features they've added, I don't know about them. Um, I'm guessing it's still exploitable. And again, it's not that Firefox is magically better written, it's that stuff's getting fixed quicker. Is there a, is there a reason why Apple isn't reading the same change logs and <laughs> fixing these things proactively? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say they're not. It, it, again, it's, it's not an uncommon problem for commercial software vendors. You see a lot of people that bundle up open source software in commercial products and their software life cycle is not the same as the open source life cycle. An open source product, they might have people you know, writing changes on a daily basis. If you were a commercial software company, you want to put that through QA, you, know, you want to do rigorous testing of that, make sure it's not going to cause any problem. Because still, you having a glitch that caused you know, some kind of bad user experience because of a bug, it's worse for Apple than, than a security vulnerability. They're more concerned with that. They want everything to just work. So it's not that they're not aware of them. It's that, well, we know that's out there. We've assessed that risk and said, you know what? We're willing to live with that until we have the time to on our six month or whatever, whatever our schedule is going to be to actually release the new version of that, which maybe that'll still be behind. So it's really, if you think about it, they're in the same place that Microsoft was several years ago, where they're kind of lackadaisical. They're not releasing things on a regular schedule. You know, good or bad, Microsoft has this one month, here's your patch, and they're on it, and if it's really bad, it could be even sooner. Apple is a lot more laid back about it. They're heading more in that direction. Because of things like the month of Apple bugs, they're, they're seeing more of these things come up. They're getting a little bit more freaked out. They're taking a little more seriously, but they're still a little laid back about it. But yeah, it's, that's not a problem unique to Apple. A lot of other people have the same issues with their open source software, their bundling commercial stuff. It's not an easy thing to get around. You know, reality is a lot of these open source things, maybe they weren't as stable. You know, they had the security problem fixed, but it hasn't been tested enough to really know it's not going to cause any other problems. Anybody else? All right, thanks a lot.